I can see John Jones taking a little bit longer, more because he wants to make sure he's absolutely ready. And also the rumor was that like he was going to fight and if he'd beaten Stipe, he was going to retire. So like he doesn't want to like rush his retirement. Now right, right? Like, you're so. this black belt rolling with this blue belt. He puts you in a heel hook. You don't know what this is. You know, your ignorance added with your, your egos is what causes that injury. Injury will always result in anatomical consequence. So like a lot of times you get these knuckles in jiu-jitsu, be like, you know, they, they get arm barred, like, oh, I'm okay. It just popped a few times. Like, what do you think that happened? Like, what is that? Like pretty much like what's one of the major things that we attack, we attack someone's neck, right? Not everybody does neck strengthening, which seems kind of silly. Like people will go lift weights, but like, what are you doing for your neck? Which is the thing that's getting it. So if like, let's say I need to defend myself. I put someone to sleep. Like they're probably not going to be aggressive. So if I was law enforcement, that is like, what I would theoretically say, this is like the best way to restrain someone. But obviously with everything that's been happening in the world, you know, the, so what happens as your arms kind of rotating, um, as opposed to it, like the shoulder itself being the problem, the bone is going to get that rotation effect. And that's what, what will break. So, uh, that one's a pretty, um, <laughs> pretty interesting one to watch when you see live. Welcome back to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel. Today's guest is Mike Pajkowski, aka Dr. Kikas, who is a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. He's an ex-mixed martial artist and a doctor in physical therapy. Mike, how are you, mate? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, so I understand it's a little bit early there, so it's a bit of a time difference, mate. So I appreciate you getting out of bed for us. Yeah, no worries. I'm, I was up anyway, so we're all good. Yeah, good man. Um, so I've been following your content for quite a while. So uh, I really enjoy the infographics that you do around sort of inju injuries in jiu-jitsu and martial arts. Um, for those that might not be familiar with what it is you do, I know you're a doctor in physiotherapy or in physical therapy, but can you explain for the maybe the UK audience who don't have the same level of understanding of terminology what it is that you actually do? Is that okay? Sure, yeah. So in the US, the term is physical therapist. In, in the UK, it's I think actually almost every, everywhere else in the world it's a physio. Um, at one point, um, originally you could treat, uh, in the U S with a bachelor's degree and then, um, they transitioned to a master's and then a doctorate. So pretty much all physical therapists now have to be a, a doctor of physical therapy. Now, if you'd already had a bachelor's, you were grandfathered in, but I guess in some parts of the country, uh, some parts of the world, that's not the case. So I imagine the UK, it's probably still a bachelor's. Um, so what does a physical therapist or physio do? So it's the management of injury. So someone comes with an acute injury. How do we get them from injury to back to whatever they want to do? And, you know, obviously there's a lot of different physical therapy specialties. I would call myself an orthopedic sport physical therapist because a lot of times when you go see your physio, like you might have like a, a, a small injury and, you know, they get you back to kind of like doing pretty good, but they're not necessarily getting you back to jujitsu. And that's kind of like where I feel that gap where, you know, like someone has an injury, how do we get them? Because the demands of like every day is vastly different than getting back to jujitsu. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you, you have a little bit of insight into jujitsu as well, being a, uh, a jujitsu black belt. Yeah, that is correct. Awesome. And you, I think you mentioned just off air a second, you've been training for about 17 years in Brazilian jujitsu. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, something I have to redo the math, but something like it's it's been a while. Awesome. And you were a sort of martial artist and a fighter before you were a clinician. Yeah. Um, what, 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 sort of what, what is your competition experience? I think you did a bit of MMA as well as jiu-jitsu. Could you tell us about that real quick? Yeah. So uh, I started uh, I started MMA. I started doing some MMA. And my first fight I lost because I was solely like a jiu-jitsu guy with no wrestling and no striking. And then I started doing kickboxing and boxing. So I had a few kickboxing fights, uh, amateur fights. Uh, then I went back to MMA, you know, I, I had a pro fight. I was supposed to have more pro fights, but, um, you know, unfortunately like the fight promotion is not like the most, um, organized industry. So, you know, I didn't get back into it. And then I was uh, pretty consistent. Like I still compete in jiu-jitsu, uh, competed a few months ago. Um, you know, people are always like, Oh, do you ever want to go back to fighting? I'm like, I actually would love to fight again. But that doesn't mean I should, you know, like mm. <laughs> MMA is one of those things you're either all in or all out. And if you're not all yeah. in, don't do it. It's just not worth the risk. But jujitsu is one of those things like I mean, injuries still are going to happen in competition, as I discussed. But I think the injury risk is much more 
easy to control. Like, don't like, you know, if I go to a competition, like I'll just tap, like, does it matter if I lose? It doesn't like, it doesn't affect me financially. Nobody cares versus like when you're like actually competing in MMA, like essentially your livelihood in most cases is dependent on success. So it kind of changes things a little bit. Yeah, hundred percent. And I'm interested, was it, was it, you know, jujitsu and the, the joint manipulation that sparked your interest in then sort of physiotherapy and then physical therapy? You know, so it was actually interesting. So I, uh, I actually thought I wanted to open my own jujitsu gym and I was like trying to be a fighter and I was like, well, what can I do and also train jujitsu? So I was like looking into being like a personal trainer. Um, at the time I didn't have the right temperament because I was like kind of a quiet, shy person. So I'm like, I just couldn't, you know, if you're, you're a personal trainer, you have to be a salesman. Right. Um, and then I was like looking for jobs and I was looking at like, what's a physical therapy assistant. And I was like applying for jobs. And then I re- realized that I had to, uh, actually be like certified, uh, cause a, a physical therapy assistant, it's like, it's a associate's degree. So it's, it's easier to get, but it's still a degree and a certification, you know? And then I started talking I'm like, yeah, you know, maybe physical therapy would be kind of interesting. Ironically, I never actually thought I was going to merge the two. I just thought I'm like, well, there is overlap because, One's healing the body and one's hurting the body. So I guess it's kind of interesting. And then somehow I developed, was able to kind of merge the two. And, you know, now you're seeing a lot more like jujitsu physical therapists popping up. But at the mm. time, it didn't really exist. Yeah, because I think Lachlan Giles is the same, isn't he? I think he's a physiotherapist, I believe. Yeah, I, he's a – so in Australia, again, he's a, a PhD in, in physiotherapy. So from a PhD, I think he's more of research-based. Um, mm. From like listening to him, I think he didn't really work too much as a physio. Like I think he probably worked as a physio. Then he started doing physical therapy research, and then he opened his gym, and then that was it. I think his wife is probably more an actual treating physio. I think like I think he did primarily mostly research. And, and do you find that 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 knowledge of anatomy definitely helps your jujitsu as well? Would you say? Oh yeah, absolutely. Like I I remember I was doing helix for years. And then I like I wouldn't tap people. I'm like, what's going on? And then like I was I was looking at the joints. I was like, that's why I wasn't finishing people. So there is definitely stuff that I've taken away from what I've learned, and I can apply it to jujitsu. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Uh, so you're the right man to talk to about jujitsu injuries, of which there seems to be quite a lot. I think. Yeah. Um, before we get into the jujitsu stuff, just thinking about current affairs, we've obviously seen sort of recently that John Jones is is out due to a uh, I think it was a pec tear. Correct. And I. I did see that you did a quick post around that, but that's just, can we start there? Like what are your thoughts on an injury? Is he, is he going to be back and when? Yeah. So like a pec tear repair is kind of a, a funky thing. So there are some people that might say you don't need surgery, but honestly, if you look at some of the evidence of like the, just the long-term weakness, like for him to be a professional athlete with, without getting surgery doesn't make any sense. So obviously he needs to go get the surgery. Um, What's the mechanism of any type of like muscular tear? So you see this a lot with, um, I mean, the similar thing happened with like Corey Sanhagen where he tore his tricep. So anytime there's a muscle t- tear or a muscle tendon injury, it's usually with uh, the muscle in a lengthened position. So it's getting stretched and the, um, the muscle can't control the eccentric portion. So eccentric means the gravity's winning. Um, so it's as it's lengthening, the muscle can't control that length, and then that's when it pops. And you can kind of see that it's hard to see in the video because you know John Jones shoots for a double, and his arm is kind of like he, he's almost like he was trying to like knock the guy over with his arm. And I think the guy put his weight on his arm as he did it, and then it went. So you really wouldn't have imagined that that would have torn his his pec. Um, clinically, most pec tears that I hear about in jiu-jitsu or from arm bars because like as your arms get extended sometimes people turn away and the pec goes before the arm i mean i've heard that one like very very often so that's usually mm. what, where we're going to see most grappling jiu-jitsu based pec tears but obviously you know it happened to john jones while he's wrestling yeah what do you reckon the uh, recovery is going to be on that so the, the problem with like pec tear uh, repair is like for the first like 12 months, like you're really not doing a whole lot of strengthening because you have to think that too, like the, the surgeon will suture the muscle down and things have to kind of heal. So if you start to contract the muscle or strengthen it, it's, it's kind of pulling on those sutures. So usually around 12 weeks is when you can do like real strength training. And, you know, I, I did a post on this, so I had some, some 
some research. You know, most people kind of get back to sport anywhere from, I think it was like 6.1 plus or minus 1.7 months. But, you know, what does that mean? So is, is it getting back to full training and then you have to do your fight camp? Now, there are some fighters that are kind of crazy. Like one that pops in a, into my head would be Tony Ferguson when he had his LCL repair. He essentially didn't have a fight camp. He just rehabbed and fought which is so yes, crazy. Mental. Like he had literally no fight camp. I, I think John Jones is different. Like if you watch his career, he tends to be a little bit more cautious, which I think is probably the better way, like, you know, being a little bit more cautious. So if I, if I would imagine, um, I know Dana White said eight months, I could see John Jones taking a little bit longer more because he wants to make sure he's absolutely ready. And also the rumor was that like he was going to fight and if he'd beaten Stipe, he was going to retire. So like, he doesn't want to like rush his retirement fight. Right. Like, so, Mm. you know, I would say for him, you know, it might be like six to eight months recovery and then at least a two to three month, um, fight camp, you know, because there's a difference between going back to training and then training for a fight. Those are like two different things. So, you Mm. know, I think in the post I said eight months seems um, possible. I would probably say probably closer to a year is like when we'll actually see that fight. Yeah. Okay. So we might get to see Tom Aspinall as the uh, heavyweight champion for a while, hopefully. Then, yeah. Huh? Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, that's actually a, yeah. a really – you know, it's interesting when stuff like this happens because like Aspinall and uh, Sergey is like a fascinating fight that we probably wouldn't have seen if this didn't happen, at least for a few years. Yeah, and that'd be a good one. Right, let's talk uh, jiu-jitsu injuries then. So Danny's relatively new. He's been training about 15 months. So I think so far, mate, you've been pretty all right with injuries, haven't you? Touch wood. Touch wood. Touch wood. So I'm a little bit older and I've been going a little bit longer. So I've had a fair few. So I've, I've done my shoulders, my ribs, um, my neck's always jacked up. So I know far just too well about injuries in jiu-jitsu. So... I'm curious, I guess, to start with just the, the, the kind of the landscape of injuries in jiu-jitsu. So, I mean, looking at the literature, and I think you did a little post about this a while back, mate, but, you know, the, the injury incidents in jiu-jitsu, um, you know, is it, is it common or is it just that we train too much? I mean, I, I think some of the stuff that I read, you know, obviously when you look at the literature, there's multiple different, you know, um, studies, but... I would say on average, we're looking about like two thirds of the people who train are going to have at least one injury. Now, injury can be kind of like broken up because in in a lot of the papers, they define injury differently. A lot of times an injury is something where you have to like stop training for like two weeks. So like there could be like a lot of like mild, like mild things, like you had something significant, like very insignificant. It was still an injury, but not enough to hold you. But like something, an injury was something that would keep you off the mats for at least two weeks would be um, to find his injury in, in a few of these papers. And like I said, it was about two thirds of people had an injury. Yeah. Okay. And, and what is the, um, you know, what, what does the, the research show us in regard to, I guess, the reasons for why people get injured? Is it, you know, is it, is it ego? Is it bad training partners? Is it incompetence? Mm. What, what does it tell us? So, Research doesn't actually support that. It just looks at the different mechanisms of where injury occurs. So a lot of this is based on my clinical experience. Clinically, I mean, ego's definitely a thing. So let's say, <laughs> like, I'm a black belt. I'm rolling with a blue belt. He gets me in a, a you know, a, le- a heel hook. Do I want to tap to this blue belt? So there's the one, there's the egos. I don't want to tap, right? And then there's two, there's also ignorance. So I think a lot of leg lock injuries, especially like back, like back a few years, were ignorance because – you take a heel hook. Well, a lot of gyms don't train heel hooks. So when people are put in a heel hook, they don't respond correctly, right? So now you're this black belt rolling with this blue belt. He puts you in a heel hook. You don't know what this is. You know, your ignorance added with your your egos is what causes that injury. You know, incompetence. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like stuff, like there's always going to be, it's, it's a combat sport. Injuries are going to happen. So there is always that. But I would say that uh, ignorance and ego are going to be like the main ones, um, at least for avoidable injuries. I should say that because mm. there's some things you can't avoid. But avoidable injuries, it's ego and uh, and ignorance. Yeah. Okay. And do we typically see more injuries in, in competition or in the training room? Oh, definitely in the training room. But that's just like sheer numbers. If you think about it, it's like yeah. how many people train and don't compete. And then just that now you have to not only think about all the people who train and don't compete, but how much 
map time do you have compared to your competition time? So it's going to be like, you know, I mean, if 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 you take uh, if you take like okay, I've been training for almost two decades. You can take all my competition. So like maybe I've been competing like point zero one percent of the time I'm on the mat. So that's not that much. So if you extrapolate that, if you look at some of the data, you know, most injuries happen in training. Uh, you know, you'd say about like seventy to eighty percent, maybe ten percent happen to competition. So if you think about it that way you're still more likely to get injured in competition than training, but most people are going to get injured in training just because they're not competing as much as they, they train. Yeah. Okay. And I always wonder, and I guess I don't, I don't know, looking at research, I don't know if this is um, necessarily going to be there, but maybe from your own experience, do you find that jujitsu practitioners who compete will train harder and therefore are more at risk of injury? Or do you find that it's maybe the opposite where people that don't compete are less conditioned and therefore get injured? What do you tend to see? No, I think uh, athletes are more prone to get injured, Um, but it's, it's, it's an intensity and then a mat time. So they're just going to be on the mats longer. The more time you're on the mat, there's more opportunities for you to get injured. Yeah. Got you. Okay. Matt, retire, mate. (laughs) You get injured too. (laughs) Um, so one thing that I've always been really interested with is, is obviously the anatomy of, of, of jiu-jitsu or of the body and, and obviously where we attack it with jiu-jitsu. And there's obviously a, a number of really common submissions. And what would be amazing, mate, today, if we went through maybe almost worked down the body from, from neck right down to ankle. Um, and just if you could break down maybe, you know, what we're attacking. So, for example, with a guillotine, what, what, what structures are we potentially damaging there? Sure. Um, you know what? What? What do those? Why are those structures important to our movement and our function as mm-hmm. humans? And potentially, what are the risks in regard to you know sort of the extent of injury, you know the outcome of the injury and the recovery? Would that be okay to go through that? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, that's the stop with the guillotine then, because I'm always diving on next. So I'm, what am I doing to people? Okay, so we'll actually break it. I want to actually kind of like break chokes down. A little mm-hmm. bit. Um, so we'll kind of we'll, we'll attack guillotines in a second. But just so, so people who who are unaware, generally when we do uh, chokes in jiu-jitsu, there's two terms. There's a strangle and a choke. So a strangulation is the occlusion of blood flow. A strangle, or sorry, a choke is the occlusion of airflow. I don't know if it was a you know a you know a Portuguese thing, but everything in jiu-jitsu we say are chokes, even though really what we're trying to do is a strangle. So just so we're all on the same page. So when we do a strangle, generally there's two proposed mechanisms of how we would render someone unconscious. So one, if we get bilateral carotid compression, what happens is if once we reduce the blood flow, now we don't have to stop it, we reduce it about 50%, that is what will induce someone to be go unconscious. And usually takes anywhere from nine to 10 seconds when applied properly. Um, that being said, the jugular compression also plays a role. Now, from all of my reading, I think the carotid compression is still um, the main primary thing that puts someone to sleep. But the jugular compression is is an additional thing. So if the jugular vein is compressed, it increases some of the pressure in the head, which can also induce, you know, someone unconscious. Now, obviously, it's, it's not a, a huge difference because if I'm compressing the carotid, I'm probably – compressing the jugular i don't know if you can compress one and not the other if you're doing a strangle so you know obviously i'm just being very nitpicky but ultimately that's kind of how we again we apply our strangle hold someone goes to sleep now a choke hold would be you know sometimes when a choke isn't as clean it's maybe more on the throat someone can't breathe you know someone will still go to sleep when that happens it just takes longer so from a blood choke like i said nine to ten seconds from um, a choke it could be anywhere from like 30 to 60 seconds there's a little bit less data on that um there's actually some studies which is very interesting i'm interested where they actually would apply some vascular restraints so they could actually see what happened to people so they put someone to sleep um i don't think that they can do that for a choke because it tends to be a little bit more traumatic so we don't have that data currently. Um, so that being said, so now we can look at um, like a rear naked choke, which is you know a clear blood occlusion. Um, some guillotines are going to be true blood occlusions, right? If, if you're able to block both, I would say most people that attack a guillotine, it's going to be a little bit more of a throat compression. So it's going to be a little bit more of a, um, an airway compression. Now, some people are going to tap because they can't breathe. Some people are going to tap 
because it's painful. So when it comes to the neck injury, it's it's a little bit harder to kind of uh, pinpoint what structures are attacked because generally what's happening is your neck is going to be compressed like so, which is going to stretch both the muscles. It's going to stretch uh, some of the, the ligaments. But you have to think like when we're attacking the spine, the neck is not one joint. The, every segment in the, the neck is its own joint. So you have your upper cervical, mm-hmm. so your first two, they kind of move a little bit different than the other um, five. So a lot of times when people have a neck crank, really like one segment is getting forced too far and that hurts. Now, you know, for the, the course of this, obviously, we don't have to go that in detail. So generally what we're going to do is you're going to have like, um, again, some of those muscles are going to get strained. And when those ligaments also get stretched, like so it gets stretched too far, then the body's protective mechanism is to tighten up, which is why after you get a neck injury, you kind of like seize up and everything tightens because your body says, hey, I don't know the next time this is going to happen. Um There is also some risk, uh, I have heard about this, of people having like kind of like a throat compression. So I have heard of a a hyoid bone fracture. So there's a bone in the throat. But again, like the amount of times I've heard, I've literally only heard about that once in my entire career training jujitsu. So I think it's unlikely, but again, it is a possible injury. Mm -hmm. And in regard to the actual cutting off the blood to the brain and the rendering somebody unconscious is there any risk there because you know it's happened on plenty of plenty of occasions for me and it's i I think i'm fine who knows (laughs) but um others might argue (laughs) um but i know sort of from the outside observer looking at that that's like horrifying to people Yeah. yeah so you have to think if so if someone goes to sleep after 10 seconds i don't think you're gonna actually see long term brain damage unless someone's held for like two to three minutes maybe a minute but like so in jujitsu, like we understand when s- you should have awareness of when someone's going to sleep. So even when like you, you watch those competitions where the ref like intervenes late, I still don't think you're even close for that fighter to have risk of um, a long-term brain injury from not getting the brain uh, blood to the brain. So there was a few different studies I've looked at from the safety of strangulation specifically for jujitsu. So one was kind of looking at, um, what were some of the negative repercussions from jiu-jitsu athletes and what happened. And it was um, a study, I think there was about like 4,000 participants. Um, there was no like long-lasting uh, from either being cloaked, from either being like strangled to uh, near unconsciousness or actually going to sleep. So the most common thing afterwards was afterwards people kind of get up and then they kind of feel dizzy. Uh, most Mostly that dizziness lasts for like a minute. There were a few people that might have had like lasting dizziness for like up to a day. Anyone who had injuries longer than a day was like something sort of unrelated. So in this one paper, one guy had like neck pain, but he had like a pre-existing neck injury. One person had like bad posture. There was one person, as I discussed, who had the hyoid bone fracture. Um, But other than that, there was no long-term issues from being choked, again, either to Near unconsciousness or actually going unconscious? It seems crazy because people from the outside would look at that and they'd think, you know, getting choked out repeatedly. Like we sit on the mats practicing it, don't you? Mm-hmm. And, you and people yeah. would look at that and think, no way yeah. is that safe. You know, it, which is which is kind of sad because of everything that's happening in the world. But like if I was a law enforcement, like this, in my opinion, as someone who does jujitsu, like the safest way to control someone would be to like put a strangle, put them to sleep. And then you can kind of like, because after they go to sleep, like Jenny, you wake up and you're confused. So if like, let's say, I need to defend myself. I put someone to sleep. Like they're probably not going to be aggressive. So if I was law enforcement, that is like what I would theoretically say. This is like the best way to restrain someone. But obviously with everything that's been happening in the world, you know, the, the concept of doing these, these uh, vascular restraints is a, on a lot of scrutiny. Um, but I think that just depends on who, how well the person who applies the technique so they know when they're doing it safely. So they're not just mm-hmm. holding someone for like five minutes at a time. But what I was going to say, there's another paper that looked at like, what are some of the long-term repercussions of jujitsu? Like, you know, even if, you know, like I've been training for a long time, um, there's times that I've been put to sleep, not that many, but I have been put to sleep and there's times that have been near put to sleep. And what they found was that they actually think that the body um, responds positively to that. So because of that, like your brain, it almost, there's also almost a neuroprotective mechanism that occurs from having that happen. Now that paper, there was only about 10 subjects. So the, 
the, the mm-hmm. amount of people we were working with, well, not we, but the amount of people that the, the researcher was working with was small. So it was something that would probably need a little bit more um, of a sample size to have more credibility. But again, it, it did show that, you know, it's not like, you know, because there's like the rumor of like every time you go to sleep, it's easier for you to get put to sleep, which this paper would actually argue against. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because I know that's certainly the case when you get hit in the jaw, right? Typically yeah, speaking, I, 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 haven't, yeah. I haven't been. Yeah, well, that's the thing is, yeah. is a lot of times people will associate <laughs> their uh, being choked unconscious is the same as getting knocked out, and they're like vastly different mechanisms. Because when you get hit in the jaw, when you get a concussion, it's essentially it's an axonal shearing that happens in the brain, it has nothing to do with going to sleep from a choke. Yeah. Okay, and and then I guess a few other things that that people might think when they see a guillotine or a, a neck being attacked. One is a broken neck, and you you might need to define what that even means. And then also discogenic problems as well. So yeah. um, sort of issues, you know, with nerves and and change in sensation and issues with down the arms and so on. Sure. Could you uh, could you tell us what a broken neck would look like first of all, if that's even a thing? Yeah. So a broken neck it would probably be like a some type of damage to one of the vertebrae in the neck. I mean, yeah. honestly, I've never heard of someone breaking a neck from a guillotine. I've heard of people getting mm. slammed on their neck. So, like, mm. if you're going for the guillotine and then you fall back and then they do, like, an axial compression, like, that's a that's a way that you can fracture your neck. But from the guillotine itself, I don't see that the case. There's actually a really interesting – it's an old fight. It was the old IFL. You see Dan Miller. He put someone in a guillotine. And literally the guy's head is, like, the other way. It was like the, the most disgusting guillotine I've ever seen. And if that guy didn't break his neck, like I don't think it's possible to break your neck. <laughs> did, did he tap? Did he, he tap? <laughs> oh, yeah. He tapped. Oh, yeah. That was – yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then we can talk about discogenic. So this gets a little bit funky because like I don't think that in most cases when someone applies a submission once, that's what's going to cause uh, a herniated disc. I think it's more of an accumulation of stresses that will eventually do it. So it's kind of unfortunately bad luck. So when we talk about a herniated disc, so essentially you have the vertebrae, which is the bone, and then you have the spacer between the bone, which is a little bit softer. Inside that uh, disc, there's a this, uh, like I guess, a softer substance. That What can happen is with repeat exposure, some of that, that, that stuff inside can start to get pushed out. And then the worry is, is eventually when it pushes through the disc, it can compress a nerve. And when it presses a nerve, then people can have pain shooting down an arm or a leg. They can have weakness. Um, if the nerve is compressed long enough, they can start to have muscle atrophy. Um, but like I said, is I, I don't think, and this is also something where like there's not a lot of research of, you know, like you go into the lab and, and someone's cranking in someone's neck. How long does it take for you know, hurry a disc to happen. So like I said, I think it's a lot of repeated exposure to, um, mm. to these things. So that's why it's a little bit tricky to say. Um, obviously people are going to get herniated discs from jujitsu. It could be from these chokes or these neck cranks. It could be just getting slammed on your head, but I would argue it's more of a wear and tear than like an acute injury. Do you, uh, do you think that iron, iron neck, is it called? Do you think that's useful in preventing it? So, so the iron neck, uh, so I have an iron neck. Um, I think that's an advanced neck strengthening tool. And that's one of the things that's kind of interesting in jujitsu is like, you know, pretty much like what's one of the major things that we attack, we attack someone's neck, right? Not everybody does neck strengthening, which seems kind of silly. Like people will go lift weights, but like, what are you doing for your neck? Which is the thing that's getting attacked, right? Um, so I use I'll use the iron neck for advanced. A lot of times, though, to keep in mind, people try to do the iron neck way too soon. Like if you've never strengthened your neck and you just grab the iron neck, and I've done this to myself. I've worked with UFC fighters who hurt their neck again. Like these are dudes with strong necks, um, and they'll strain their neck. So you have to ease up with that. So like from like for with with my clients, if they have an iron neck and we're going to do it, I might take about four to six weeks of doing like different neck strengthening before I'd even introduce the, uh, the iron neck. There's another tool that I use that I actually like a little bit better for rehab. It's called the next level. Almost looks like a, a skateboard. I think the original model was like a skateboard where you like rest your head on it and you can move side to side. 
I like that a little bit better for neck rehab just because it's a little bit more focused and a little bit less load versus the iron neck. Even though it's sold for rehab, I don't think it's a good rehab tool. It's just too much stress. So the fact that people just do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and therefore would, I guess, defend these chokes, would wrestle, would would use their head as a wedge, that that, that you find that that doesn't always strengthen the neck enough to, as a prerequisite to use specific strengthening techniques? Well, you could take – like so – and I think this is what happens, especially with a lot of like recreational hobbyists, like, you know, like they want to be fit. So jujitsu is what they do to be active, but you, you do have to do some type of supplemental work, whether it's strength, conditioning, mobility to maintain your body for the sport. Now, there is going to be some things like just, just the act of doing jujitsu, your neck's probably going to get stronger. But it's on you is like, is it strong enough? If, like if you have a pre existing injury, that isn't necessarily going to be enough. So it's one of those things where, you know, it depends on your goals, your problems and your injuries. You know, when I'm working with a, with an athlete, if, if they have a history of a neck injury, like we're definitely going to be adding supplemental neck injury, uh, supplement neck, uh, injury management techniques. But you know, mm-hmm. if, if someone only has like an hour a week, we kind of have to triage, like what's the most important thing to work on, which might not be the, the neck it just depends on the person. Uh, I had this conversation with someone today that, they basically said they kept getting shoulder problems and this and that from jiu-jitsu. And I just said to them, how often are you in the gym? You know, you're at 10 hours on the mats and you're not hitting the gym ever. And I said, do six hours and four hours in the gym and that shoulder problem will get a lot better. You, you, it's, it's, I think you become a mat rat, don't you? <laughs> and uh, all you want to do is jiu-jitsu. But I think so many people will benefit, not just from a recovery point of view, but an actual performance po- point of view if they just take a little bit of time and then work on their their, phys, their physical side and their, and their flexibility as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. We'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later, actually, because yeah. I think it'd be good to talk around that some more. Um, all right, let's, let's move on to the next body part then. So the, the shoulders. So we I think Kimura and Americana or Keylock are probably the two that people typically attack. And I know the shoulder by its nature is quite a, quite a sort of unstable or vulnerable joint anyway. But yeah. can you break down those couple of submissions and, and what we're potentially attacking from an anatomy perspective there? Sure. We'll, we'll start with Americana. So she'll, that's going to be like an externally rotated position. So when that happens, specifically with the Americana, what we're doing is we're kind of stressing um, the joint capsule. Every time there's a joint, we're always attacking the joint capsule. With the joint, with the shoulder specifically, it being literally the most mobile joint in the body, the best way to think about it is it's not like a ball and socket like most people think. It's more like a golf ball on a tee, right? So it's like not really like that stable. So then you have this this uh, soft cup, which is a labrum, which isn't hard. It's soft, which gives that humeral head a little bit better socket to fit in. So a lot of times with those extreme motions, what we're doing is we're actually stretching or potentially tearing the labrum because, again, that's the static structure that that uh, humeral head sits in. We also can have some muscle issues. So the rotator cuff, or most people call it like the rotor cuff, cup or something. So the (laughs) rotator cuff is a collection of four muscles. So what they do is they're like little suction cups that kind of like wrap around that humeral head and they keep it snug. So a lot of times people are going to have a labral tear and, and like they don't even know. And that's because that their rotator cuff is so strong, it can keep the humeral head centered even if your labrum is compromised. So... When someone's doing an Americana, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to be potentially damaging that labrum, potentially stretching or damaging the tendon. I would say that likely the static structures are going to have a little bit more problem. The one thing that I'd be worried about with the Americana, um, which it's not necessarily Americana, it'd be more of like if let's say like uh, someone has like a whizzer and they jerk. What we're doing is we're, by, by bringing that in, that humeral head forward, we're actually subluxing or dislocating a shoulder. Now, I don't think I've ever heard of someone dislocating a shoulder, but you can definitely sublux that that uh, humeral head as it kind of gets thrown forward. Um, and the reason why I don't, I don't see as much with uh, Americana is usually people aren't jerks. They apply it slow. But if, like, let's say I have a wizard, right, and they have an underhook and I jerk it forward, like, that is where you can see some of those, like, humeral head subluxations. So, and then every time a joint goes out of place, it's, again, damaging the labrum stretching the joint capsule and then it's going to make the joint more susceptible to being either further supplux or dislocated now we can go to the kimura 
Now, interestingly, now you're still going to have damage to the rotator cuff or the labrum with a Kimura, but most of the traumatic injuries you're going to see from a Kimura is actually going to be a humeral head fracture. Um, sorry, a humeral, um, a humerus spiral fracture. So what happens as your arms kind of rotating, uh, as opposed to it like the shoulder itself being the problem, the bone is going to get that rotation effect, and that's what what will break. So uh, that one's a pretty um, <laughs> pretty interesting one to watch when you see live. I've uh, I've I've fractured my humerus. You fractured your humerus, Kamara? No, uh, no, football, football, or, yeah, or, or soccer for you, mate. Soccer, yeah, yeah. But yeah. For, I um, yeah, I landed on it, snapped it out, is minging. Yeah. But yeah, it does hurt. <laughs> really hurts. From a from a sort of um, a healing perspective, what what's worse, like a, a sort of muscle or a tendon tear or a ligament tear or or a bone fracture? Oh, that's tough. Um, so like theoretically a bone would be better assuming it's like a simple break because bone healing, it's like you put the parts together six, to eight weeks, it heals. Now that doesn't mean someone's necessarily back on the mats at eight weeks, but cause you, now you have to deal with the fact that you, you haven't used your shoulder in eight weeks. So there's going to be some stuff. So if that happens, obviously that's going to be a little bit better. Um, what we're seeing now with these, like these uh, tibia fibula fractures that we saw with like Conor McGregor or Anderson Silva. I mean, even though like, I think a lot of these aren't necessarily simple. Some of them might be compound, meaning the bone actually like pokes out and breaks the skin. Um, I mean, like these injuries are taking over a year for them to get back to. So, you know, that's, that's tough. You know, it, it just, I think it just depends. I mean, if you have a labral labrum tear, like you're probably back to jiu-jitsu in about, if you've a repair, obviously, you're back to jiu-jitsu probably like six months. I think with the um, a, a bone break, it's more the confidence back in in where you've broke. Mm. I remember when I did my arm, it it felt good after seven or eight months, but really it was about eighteen months until I felt like I wasn't going to refracture it from just yeah. using it again. You know that that yeah. psychological battle maybe where I dislocated yeah. my shoulders and done other things before. Once that was repaired, it felt quite good quite quickly. I think that's the only difference with a bone break towards a, a ligament. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And then with, um, from a rehabilitation perspective, so I, I feel like rehabbing, and I know, that, as you say, some of the structures around the bone may, may also be damaged as a result or, you know, may, may, you may see some sort of atrophy or, or sort of weakening of the muscles there. But from a re- rehabilitation perspective, do you tend to find that bone breaks, once the healing is done, the re-strengthening and the, the return to play is therefore quicker than that of a, a tendon injury or a muscle injury. Yeah, because I mean, once the bowl's bones healed, assuming it was just a simple break, you had no damage to the muscle, so it just you put in the work, it gets stronger. Versus with like a tendon injury, we do have to be a little bit more careful because the tendon is repaired. The more that we strengthen it, the more we're pulling on the repair. So it kind of means that we have to ease into strengthening a little bit. So. Yeah, I would say the bone break would be an easier rehab, but not necessarily a quicker return to sport. Yeah, okay. And and, and especially with a spiral fracture, I feel like that would be a slightly more complicated um, break to heal as well um, yeah. because it's not a simple snap, right? Yeah, and also then you have to think too that like a spiral fracture might require a surgery. Like they might have to put like a, a metal rod in the bone, which makes bone t- healing he- uh, harder. Um, and also then there's always some people depending on the injury that they, they later have to go in and take the rod out because people have pain from the rod. So from it. You, know, you might need like a, another surgery to take it out. <laughs> it's horrible. Isn't it? I was yeah. quite lucky. I, I, um, I turned up for surgery and it got canceled on that day and they was touch and go whether they were going to operate. And then I was like, Oh, it's fate. I'm not getting it done. And I didn't get it done. And luckily it like healed perfect. Mm. And, <laughs> and I was, I was good. I'm so glad I didn't get the surgery though. Cause yeah, uh, yeah I've, touch wood i've i've been fine with it yeah and i guess like you say you, you talked about um sublax and, and dislocation could you just explain i think most people know what a dislocation is um mm. but a subluxation people may not know what that means could you just quickly explain what that that is from a terminology perspective as well please mate sure so a dislocation is you take the joint and it comes out of the socket and it's gone sublux means it partially di- partially goes out of socket but then it comes back in so even though you don't need it to be relocated afterwards, like it popped back in on its own, like it's still causing trauma. So every time a joint dislocates, like I said, that joint capsule gets stretched so it's easier for it to happen. Then you also have to think that the bone, the humeral head or or whatever, 
the, the end of the bone is kind of scraping against something else. So every time it dislocates, you're likely to have some type of cartilage damage. And the problem with cartilage is once your cartilage is gone, like there's no there's no good cartilage repair surgery out. Like there are things that they do, but like nothing's really good. So when you have cartilage damage, that significantly increases your risk for arthritis. You don't want to have cartilage damage. So like when, you know, and, and, and like, so we can take uh, TJ Dillashaw, for example. So former UFC champion, awesome fighter. He goes into his last fight and then he says later, oh, I've had 20 dislocations within this fight camp. So every time it's popping out, it's getting easier and easier. Every time it's scraping it. So now what they're doing, so essentially he, even though he says he feels like he's in his prime, best of his, he had to, his shoulder can't handle fighting. So he retired. Well, it turns out that his, um, the humeral head was so damaged because every time uh, there's, there's cartilage damage, there actually could be fractures to the bone. It was so deformed that the, you know, they, he didn't say, but like most research, uh, shoulder surgeons probably would have done a shoulder replacement. What they do is they literally, they cut off the humeral head and they put like a metal head on, which that's why he retired. I'm pretty sure that, so he went with an experimental surgery that I, I only read about because of him. So it'll be interesting to see if he can get back to fighting. So what he had was a humeral head allograft. So what they did is they took the the head of a cadaver, a humeral head of a cadaver, and then they replaced his humeral head with this other person's, which is like, that's so wild of a surgery. It's horrible. That's something yeah. out of Frankenstein's know, monster, isn't it? That's absolutely the start. horrible. Yeah. So we'll, we'll we'll see if it's good. Like if this fails, the only thing he can do is a shoulder replacement anyway. So I think this is his literally last opportunity. Like if he can if he can somehow get back to sport. Like maybe he can fight with this, but if not, like they're gonna have to replace that that shoulder. Mm. Yeah. All right, mate. Thank you. Um, okay, so let's let's talk elbows and arm bars. So, yes. arguably, you know, to, well, it's certainly a very common um, submission in jiu-jitsu. Um and I've seen you know some horrible looking arm bars, and I've seen a combination of of sort of elbow injuries, but also sort of forearm breaks as well. So, so again, mate, can you just talk us through the, the structures that we're attacking and the damage we're potentially doing with armbars, please? Yeah, and, and, and it, keep in mind, like you said, like armbar, like if you look at like the number one in, um, joint lock that leads to an injury, it's actually the armbar. But I think it's because it's okay. like the most com- – it's one of the just – it's just such a common thing you can do from white to black belt. I mean it's it's good – you know, even at the highest levels you see armbars. So – so generally what's happening is you're going to get that elbow hyperextended. A typical elbow can have anywhere from 5 to 10 degrees of hyperextension. So, well, before they do jiu-jitsu, which we'll talk about. Uh, generally what you're going to do, the first ligament you're going, to att- you're going to hit is going to be what's called the ulnar collateral ligament or the UCL. Um, usually you're not going to get a complete tear. Like there are people that do get a complete tear. Um, and that's a surgery you hear about a little bit more in baseball. It's called the Tommy John surgery. Um in jiu-jitsu, you're going to see more partial tears of the UCL. However, if people don't tap and they let things go, you can actually dislocate the joint. So you make sure that the uh, you dislocate the humerus from the, the ulna, which obviously then also damages the connective tissue and that sort of thing. Um, even though people say break and people's forearms will break, you, you don't see a ton of arm like bone breaks from mm. an arm bar and that's generally like if it's the forearm that just means your fulcrum is off because usually what we do is like you're isolating their humerus and then this is the uh the fulcrum which is damaging so if someone has a forearm break generally that they're they're probably going to be a little bit lower um but like i said it's obviously it happens like we saw it happen with frank Mir and tim Slavia, mm. but you know i would say that it happens less often compared to just like a, a ligament sprain and Again, so there's a few things happening there, but it sounds primarily like it's it's ligament damage. Mm. Um, so again, same question as before in regard to sort of recovery and rehab of of a sort of elbow ligament injury. What what are we looking at there typically? So, like I said, most people aren't gonna have like aren't gonna need surgery for mm. a bad armbar. You know, and that's the thing I think what, what people realize is like when people are getting like an arm bar, you'll hear like a few different pops before it gets like really bad. So you kind of have like a few warning signs, um, which is good. Um, if let's say somebody does have a complete 
UCLA tear bad enough where they need surgery. You know, that that reconstruction, you look at about a year. If you look at, like, baseball, like, pitchers might take, like, a year and a half to get back after Tommy John. But I think that's just because, like, in pitching, they're just, like, literally the act of their sport is putting stress on the elbow. Versus, like, in jiu-jitsu, like, there will be stress via, like, people attacking with an arm, like an arm bar. But it's, like, it's not like you get your elbow stretched every single class. Like, you can always, like, tap early. So you're looking at about a year. Um now, that doesn't mean necessarily like it takes a year to get back to the mats. It might be anywhere from like six to nine months. But when we're dealing with ligament repair, what happens is your body – like so the surgeon takes something that was not your ligament and then it puts in your body. And it, sometimes it can be a cadaver. Sometimes it could be from somewhere else. So your body takes that structure and it actually like breaks it down on a cellular level and then it rebuilds it. So if – in, in a lot of times it's going to be like a, a tendon. So it takes a tendon and then it turns it into a ligament. So when this happens and there's so much research, this for like the ACL specifically, um, at around like the, the two to three month mark, your ligament is actually weaker than it was when the surgeon first puts it in, which is makes things kind of dangerous. Cause you're going to feel pretty good because your range of motion is going to be probably pretty good at that time. You're going to have some strength, but the actual ligament is going to be at its weakest. And again, some of this research I'm talking about is more associated with the, the ACL. But anytime there's a, a ligament graft, you can kind of extrapolate. So it could take up to about two years for that ligament to be as resilient as it was pre-injury. Now, that, like I said, like if I said two years to get back to sport, like nobody would ever get a surgery because that's like two years to get back to jiu-jitsu or whatever, like that ends someone's career. Um Specifically with the ACL, what they'd found was that around nine months, retail rates kind of plateaued. So that's why nine months is kind of like a, a common time to get back. Uh, I would say maybe with the UCL, you can get back a little bit sooner because the two mechanisms of injury that I would be concerned about would be A, either an arm bar, which is like just don't be a dummy and tap, or B, as you're falling, you kind of base your elbow out. I think that's actually one of the more common things that I'm worried about because people base out quite a bit. I have to make sure that that elbow is strong enough that it doesn't get injured in the process. Yeah. Okay. And just speaking from personal experience here. So I don't recall a particular mechanism of injury with this, like an arm or anything, but I seem to have like a chronic elbow problem, which prevents me from being able to frame. Mm. So whenever I frame, it's yeah. super painful around the backside of my elbow. So it almost feels like it's maybe, I don't know, a tendinopathy or something, but you know, is, is, is that anything that springs to mind? Could that have been an, an arm bar previously or would that be more of a repetitive strain injury? What do you think? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things you can think about, and there's a quote that I'm going to get from a guy um, that I really, um, I really respect. His name is Andrea Spina. And he said that injury will always result in anatomical consequence. So like a lot of times you get these knuckles and jiu jitsu be like, you know, they, they get armbarred like, oh, I'm okay. It just popped a few times. Like, what do you think that happened? Like, what is that? Like something happened, right? So you take, you know, it's so funny. You like look at some of these, you know, like jiu jitsu black belts and you can see like so many of them like can't straighten their elbow just because they've been armbarred so many times. And even if let's say like the, 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 the ligament isn't necessarily damaged, you just stretch it over and over and over again. Like, you know, it's not the same as it was before jiu-jitsu. So there is a chance, yes, that you do have some type of tendinopathy. But if you think about the mechanism, it doesn't really make sense. You'd almost think that you'd have more mm. of like a bicep tendinopathy. Likely yeah. what's going on is – so sometimes people will have like these osteophyte formations. So the bone bones like adapts to stress. So sometimes the actual bone in your elbow will kind of like form like a block. Sometimes little bits of – um bone will actually break off and be floating around in your elbow. So usually with jiu-jitsu athletes, it's a little bit more common for them to not be able to fully straighten their elbow because they have osteophytes in their elbow. But it, it's also the, the same bending, right? Because it's it just where those, those um, osteophytes are. There's a surgeon down in California, uh, Dr. Steve Mora, and he calls it MMA cauliflower elbow. Is a, he just <laughs> sees it so often. So I thought it was funny. Yeah, no. Interestingly, it's painful on on both full extension and flexion as well. So, um, so you may be honest with me there, mate. So, it sounds like I'm fucked, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just one of those things. Like, I'm sure you can train with it. 
Um, it yeah. might at some point you might need to get it cleaned out, but that just depends on how bad it is, you know. Yeah, I'll stick with the uh, the ghost escapes then, mate, and uh, hopefully I'll get by with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so uh, so let's move down the body then. We'll we'll, we'll ignore uh, wrist lots because they shouldn't ever happen. And they're, they're <laughs> sinful, um, <laughs> unless you particularly want to talk about. Them. But I was going to go on to knee bars. Yeah, because um, I think it has uh, you know as we've seen over the last I don't know sort of five. Seven years or so, it seems like there's been a huge shift in, in jujitsu, whereas traditionally, like wrist locks are now and always will be, but leg locks used to be a little bit of a, a dirty a dirty tactic. Yeah. It seems these days, obviously, time's moved on, and certainly in a nogi, um, leg locks are rife now, and, and knee bars and heel hooks um, seem to be more and more widely used. And we talked in the very beginning about, obviously, incompetence and ignorance of certain positions, and I think... You know, from what I can see, certainly, you know, with the leg locks, and I think you even mentioned it earlier as well, that seems to be obviously the prime um, yeah. suspect, doesn't it, in regards to people just not knowing when to tap, not knowing when they're in danger, going the wrong way and so on. So in regards to the knee bar specifically, um, what are we what are we breaking there? Is it is it a ligament? Is it a, a bone? What typically yeah. happens? So we'll break it. We'll break leg injuries into either a linear movement or a rotational movement. So... Right. Uh, knee bar is linear. Heel hook is rotational. So the linear, the, the, so you're still going to have injuries with a hyperextension of the knee. The knee t- is going to have about, it can have anywhere from five to 10 degrees of hyperextension, but unlike the elbow. So like the elbow, there's like, there's actually a bony block at some point that will stop full mm-hmm. extension. The knee doesn't have that. So, mm-hmm. you know, if there was no ligaments, you could just keep going all the way. That being said, almost every ligament is, in the knee is going to resist hyperextension. So you have two ligaments in the middle of the knee. You're going to have your ACL or your PCL. And then you have two on the outside, which is going to be your MCL and your LCL. So all of them are going to resist hyperextension. And there's there's a, an area called the posterior lateral corner. Um, what they found is that that area, specifically there's this one ligament which people don't talk about. It's called the, the uh, uh, OPL, actually has the most ability to resist hyperextension. However, it's not just hyperextension when someone does a knee bar. There's actually a little bit of what's um, going to be a glide at the tibia. So you have your, your thigh, which is your femur, and then you have your shin, which is your tibia. So you're actually going to see a little bit more ACL injuries because as people are doing this, there's going to be that glide where there's going to be um, an anterior glide of the tibia on the femur when someone applies it. Because again, you're not just hyperextending. What's, what's happening is someone's holding your femur and then moving that way. So they're kind of like thrusting their hips forward. So there's a little bit more of a, a glide. And even though PCL does play a role, PCL injuries tend to be more with like hyperflexion. So like a typical PCL injury is if someone like has like a, a bad shot, like they just fall to their knee, like they're shooting for the leg. That's typically how you're going to see like a PCL injury, um, which is why for a knee bar, you see a little bit more ACL injuries. That being said, you're not going to see as many like very bad ACL tears. Like you're not going to see as many complete tears, but it does happen. And then with the... Uh... I don't know how you want to do this, mate. Did you want to then talk through the rotational attacks and then talk about the, the tissue damage and recovery? Does that make more sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we can look at the heel hook. So there's two ways we can do it. So there's a standard heel hook, which is an outside heel hook, which rotates the tibia in. So it's tibial internal rotation. And then we can look at the inside heel hook, which does the opposite. So it's going to be rotating the tibia externally. You know, it's interesting because I've been looking at some data on what happens when you get excessive rotation. Um, and really, but uh, you almost could break it down slightly different because I think your leg control, your leg entanglement actually has a little bit more influence in what ligaments are going to be strained. Reason, so if I have a typical outside heel look, and I know it's a little bit harder for people who might not understand, but like nowadays you're going to see someone with what's called an outside ashi, meaning that if I have your leg, both of my legs my feet are on your hip. So when I do that, I actually can put a little bit of lateral pressure to the outside of your knee while I'm rotating, which is going to make us put a little bit more stress on the LCL, which is our outside ligament. At some point we can continue. It still has the ability to damage your ACL. Then 
we can look at a inside heel look. So now we're going to have what's a little bit of what's called a valgus force. So now the knee is going to be pushed in, which is the same of what happens with like a knee reap. That's why the knee reap is illegal in certain competitions is because it puts that inward pressure on the knee, which will also stress the ACL, but it will also stress the MCL. And the reason why I'm saying that is because if you look in some of the older ways that people used to apply a, a heel hook. So generally, if I was going to apply a heel hook, Back in the day, I would reap and then I would do an outside heel hook, which from a reap to the heel hook, even though it's give, adding knee rotation, it's putting that, that valgus, that medial force on the knee, which is why you're going to see more MCL and ACL injuries. And there was a paper that actually looked at that, like someone had an injury. It was more of a case study. Um, so I think the leg configuration plays an important role on what ligaments are actually damaged. Because again, if you look at it, if I solely just do um, internal rotation of the knee, again, all the ligaments play some role, ACL, LCL. Um, external rotation of the tibia is going to affect ACL, MCL, and the LCL. So I know I'm kind of like, it, it might be better with like an anatomical description, but um Essentially, all of the ligaments have a chance of being damaged. The I think your leg entanglement control plays more of a role than we realize. Yeah, okay. So with the external rotation, so that would be an inside heel hook. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. So the ACL is typically the one that people hear about. Um, mm. I think in jiu-jitsu, certainly in the UK from football or soccer as well, where you hear a lot of ACL injuries. Mm. Um, my understanding is it's typically nine months. Obviously, Conor McGregor famously had one against uh, Max Holloway. I made a pretty pretty quick recovery. I think GSP had one back in the day in the UFC as well. Um, is that is that a fair assessment? Is it is it typically about nine months to to return? And, and do you even need an ACL to return? Uh, so the answer: Do you need ACL? Depends on the person. So um, there are many people who don't have the ACL and they fight in the UFC. They were referred to as copers. There's no way like you. you there's no way to kind of like say like you're going to be a coper or not. Like some people can do well, some people can't. Um, nowadays for some people, depending on their career, I know that they do try like a period of like pre-op, uh, meaning like before they even get surgery, they're trying to, and, and partly is because if they do surgery, you want to get the knee as much range of motion as strong as possible. Cause the outcomes are better. You want as little swelling and irritation. Cause again, the, the less swelling, the better the surgery goes. Sometimes they'll also see, Hey, like if we do enough strengthening, like, are you going to be good enough? And that's really on the person, right? Like some people could do it. The biggest risk without that ACL though is you're an accelerated risk to tear your meniscus or develop arthritis. If you look at the longitudinal studies, people who have no ACL versus the people who do have an ACL um, after a surgery. So they, they tear their ACL, but they have the surgery. Um, both groups end up getting arthritis. So that's why things are tricky. It's like you're going to get arthritis whether you get the surgery or not. So – it just kind of depends on the person, right? Like, again, there's some people that can do well. Um, if you're someone like your knees, like buckling, like I think to be classified as a coper after the initial injury, like you have like one incidence of buckling, but if you've more than that, you're not a coper. So if your knee buckles, like get the surgery. Um, you know, I had a, a patient, she was a coper. She had went like eight years without an ACL, but then she ended up tearing her meniscus. I think it was a buck handle tear. So like, Hey, like we have to take, we have to repair, you know, fix this meniscus like we might as well repair the acl so this doesn't keep happening um so that's again do you need surgery now actually they're doing a lot of very interesting research in australia with this concept called cross bracing what they found was that if you hold the knee in about like 90 degrees the acl can heal the problem is like Generally, the knee is going to be in full extension. So if the knee is fully extended, those fibers can't touch, so they don't heal. But when you're you're kept in that 90-degree position, there's actually a good chance of healing. Now, this is like – this research is like – came out like I think this year. Um, the thing with that – so I'm sure we're going to hear a lot more um, upcoming info on this cross-bracing. The thing is, is the return to sports pretty similar because essentially you're in this brace for like three months and then you have to like slowly straighten your leg. Um, so the return to sports pretty similar. You're not necessarily guaranteed for the L ACL to be as strong. Now, theoretically, clinically, I would see that when you can use your own tissue, your own ACL, your outcomes are going to be better. 
But again, I think it's still too new to see how good that's going to be for like the athletic population. But again, super interesting. I'm waiting for it to come to the U.S. Now we're going to jump to your next question, which is return to sport. Yeah, so we're looking at about nine months return to sport. Um, back in the day, it used to be six, which is why like people think you could be back by six months. What they found was that like the retail rates were like still like exponentially higher. So at around six months to three months, I think every month that you wait, your retail rate drops like 50%. Um, they kind of plateau about nine months. Um, so back, like I said, back in the day, it might have been six. Now we're looking at about nine. Yeah. Okay. And do you find um, females get more ACL injuries than men? Because there's a lot of data. There's a lot of uh, football, soccer players at the moment yeah. in the in the women's game that are really struggling with the the de acceleration part when they're stopping and they're getting lots and lots of ACL injuries. Do you see that in jujitsu as well? Do do women who get you know heel hooks do they do they t- tend to have more ACL injuries or is it just you know the same across the board? I mean, that's a good question. Um, with research, you'd imagine that jujitsu is still like a pretty male dominated sport. Um, I think every paper I looked at didn't do a good job of differentiating injuries from men to women. Um, so I don't think for jiu-jitsu, like, that data is out there. I mean, like you said, women are more prone to ACL injuries. Some of that could be just the fact that they, they anatomically have a wider hip angle, which means that their knees are more prone to kind of collapsing into valgus. Um, so I think that's the potential theory on why women are more prone for ACL injuries. But for jiu-jitsu, it's hard to say. I just, I just don't think enough women practice for there to be enough research on that. Yeah, I just wondered. Yeah, yeah. I can remember I did a little bit of research when I was at uni. And um, I even did a survey study and got about 400 respondents who were entirely female. Did a bit of an epidemiology study. But I didn't compare it to like male injuries. It was just yeah. an epidemiology study of um, females. Never got it published, actually. But I'll, Michael, send it over. You might find it an interesting read. Yeah. Um, okay. And then uh, finally, the, the, old, uh, the old classic. So the, the straight foot locks or the Achilles locks and the toe holds. Yeah. What so we, uh, what we break in there? Typically, there's going to be a ligament on the outside of the ankle, which is going to be the anterior towel fibula ligament. If that gets stretched far enough, then we're going to go with another, the kind of like down the chain, it's going to be the calcaneal fibula ligament, which is kind of like on the outside part of the heel. So those are going to be like the two ligaments that you're going to generally damage both with an ankle lock or with a toe hold. Nowadays, we're, we're, we're seeing this kind of like new ankle lock because, you know, back in the day, like the whole thing was like ankle locks don't work at black belt level. Like people just let their ankles pop. But now, especially in this last year, you're actually seeing like a kind of a so many more straight ankle lock finishes. And I think um, there's this uh, Polish grappler, Mateusz Szczynski, if I'm saying his name correctly. So he has this uh, like one straight ankle lock. He calls it the shotgun ankle lock or the an Aoki ankle lock. Now with the Aoki, if you get the if you get the leg and you rotate, it's very similar to an inside heel lock. However, so what what this this is is when I'm trapping the the straight foot. What most people do is they just try to stretch the foot, which is why it's so hard to finish. Like most people can't finish a straight ankle lock on me just because they like do it wrong. What you're supposed to do is you're supposed to get that ankle to its end range uh, plantar flexion. And then when you add your hip, you're actually just trying to like dislocate the joint. So you're, it, it almost should feel similar to an arm bar. So again, I'm not stretching. I'm getting you here and then I'm trying to pop the ankle out that way. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, with this like uh, – you know, shotgun ankle lock, what you're doing is as opposed to just stretching, what I'm doing is I'm trapping their heel on your rib, which one makes it harder to escape because now they can't boot and they can't pull their ankle away. But then when I start to arch back because their heels on, on my rib, it actually adds a little bit of sideways eversion pressure, which is opposite of a, a, a toe hold, which is going to affect the deltoid ligament. Now the deltoid ligament is a pretty thick ligament, so you don't really see a lot of injuries there, but it's just the fact that the ankle has a lot less motion in that plane. So when someone adds that eversion and then plantar flexion, it doesn't take a lot of force to, to put that, that stress. We're trying to overload that ligament. So like me, like I'm a, I'm a dirty leg locker. So like I've been playing with this and I, I love it and it, because it's so frustrating if I want to do like an IBGF tournament where I can't heel hook. So I'm like, okay, well, what do I do instead? People don't tap to ankle locks. Well, I, now you're seeing people are tapping. And I, I think this new variation is the difference. Interesting. Have you looked at that before? Yeah. 
Have That's you? what Steve Steve was on about the other week. Was it? I've yeah. not seen it yet. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's this clever shit. Right? Mm. But again, it's that getting right to the end of the lever. I talk about that a lot. In, yeah. In, in really turning, mm -hmm. getting the ankle and. Yeah. A lot of times I let it pretend I'm letting it go and they pull their foot out a little bit and I'll relock it. <laughs> <laughs> right at the end. <laughs> You're all white belt, mate. You shouldn't be talking like this. Yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, with, with sort of lateral um, ligament tears. So I, I remember reading somewhere that the, one of the biggest risk factors of a, a lateral ankle sprain is a previous lateral ankle sprain. Um, do you tend to see like a lot of re injuries once it's gone once or is again, is this just dependent on the, the quality of the rehabilitation? So it doesn't matter what the injury is. The most, the, the biggest risk factor for an injury is previous injury. Now, I think a lot of people will sprain their ankle just because if you think about it, like classic field sports, like running sports, like you're cutting, like, so I think that's why like the ankle specifically gets the most attention, but across the board, if you have an injury, you're more prone to re-injury. I would also argue the reason why that's the case is because an injury doesn't just go back to the way it was after an injury. So what happens is you have an injury, like you say, like, let's say there's like a ligament and then there's some kind of tear as your body starts sending chemicals or hormones to kind of like patch that up. All it's doing is just, it's patching it up. It's just doing like a kind of like a crappy job of just getting the parts together. So what that's doing is it's filling that, that damaged tissue with fibrotic tissue. Fibrotic tissue is disorganized. It's weaker. It doesn't have as much stiffness. How do you get it back to the way it's supposed to? It's appropriate loading. And I really think if you think about like what is the job of a, of a physio, it's not necessarily to get somebody out of pain. My job is to get them back to sport, getting back to jiu-jitsu. Like getting someone out of pain is easy. Like let's say someone comes to me and they have an ankle injury from getting footlock. What's the easiest injury or what's the easiest way to have them to stop having pain? Like stop doing jiu-jitsu, which is a terrible answer. But that's what a lot of physicians will say because they don't mm -hmm. know the sport they don't know if like a lot of jiu-jitsu athletes specifically are, are kind of silly with their approach to injury management. But really what we want to do is we want to appropriately load that ligament. So we do appropriate stress over and over again. So that ligament starts to get strengthened because ligament tissue, just like muscle tissue responds to stress. So whenever someone has an injury, I'm like, Hey, like it might get better, but it doesn't go like, if let's say your ankle was at 100%, you injure yourself and it heals, it might go to like 99%. Pop your ankle again, now you're at 97%. And then you're going to see these black belts that are like, you know, it's so interesting watching these black belts because generally it takes a few years to get a black belt. So you're going to be in your 30s and your 40s. And they almost look like these like gnarled goats or something because like their elbows don't straighten, like they can't turn their neck. Like they're like hobbling on the mat, like, oh, I can't do that. I'm too injured. It's just because they just had so many joint injuries that they didn't manage properly. So now their joints aren't the way they were when they were in their 20s. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> We've all seen a few of those yeah. hobbling around, haven't we? Yeah. Okay, good. So, um, so yeah, that injury management and recovery is super important then regardless of injury. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so you might have already answered this because you already told us what the most common – submission is that results in injury i think you said it was the arm bar but if i were to ask you what the most dangerous submission in jiu-jitsu is what would you what would you say that is and i guess that could be in relation to the the consequences of the injury opposed to the um the, the sort of incidents of the injury yeah i'd say it's still probably i say it's a heel look so I, I worked on a study about two years ago i'm still fighting to get it published that's a whole story but uh anyway so i set in at uh Nogi Pans in 2021, which was the first major tournament where heel hooks were legal in the IBGF. So I worked with Ethan uh, Creesworth. So he's the uh, head of sports medicine for the IBGF. So he had a paper that he had done. He collected data from like 20 or 2009. So we were able to compare data from 2009 to 21. And then what we looked at was both how did injury rates increase with the addition of heel hooks. And then I specifically would also look at um, adult and masters brown and black because the only thing that separated the rules with them was in one you could include a heel look and one you couldn't because with the IBGF blue and and purple they can't the only foot lock they can do is a, is a straight ankle lock so really like you're not going to see a lot of knee injuries from a submission because you can't legally attack the knee um, and in both cases we saw an increase in knee and ankle injuries for 
both if you compare 20, uh, 2009 to 2021, and then for the um, adult and masters, brown and black. So injury rates increased um, quite a bit. And if you look at the injury incidents, so the arm bar is the most common injury. Um, but again, you can do that in the gi. You can do that no gi. You can do from white to black. From the, the knee and ankle injuries in brown and black adult, um, the injury rate was like much higher. So even though just because – in the, the first population, we're looking at a population of like 1,500 people. But for the brown and black adults, you're looking at a population of about 300. So even though there was more arm bars than heel hook injuries, the incidence rates for the arm bar was like 4%, but the heel hook, we're looking at like 18%. That makes sense? Wow, okay. Yeah. yeah. And then we can throw on the fact if, let's say, someone has a – uh, a knee injury, and then they do tear the ACL, like they could be out for nine months. So we can consider that. And you're going to see, like I said, like you usually don't necessarily need a surgery after an arm bar, unless you like literally let your arm get bent like the opposite direction. Most cases, there's like a little bit more of a buffer so you can tap. Even if there's injury happen, it can kind of, you can rehab without surgery. Um, and then I think the other thing, like I said, how do injuries happen? A lot of it's ignorance. Now, I think this is changing because we're seeing heel hooks more. But like for a while, like people just don't train heel hooks. So an interesting fact. So I came up with my social media because I was rolling with – I was a brown belt. I was rolling with this purple belt, and I, fo- I straight full lock him. And he's like, oh, yeah, I tap to those. I don't play with foot stuff. I don't want to hurt my knee. I was like, you're, pur- you're purple belt. I did a straight full lock. It doesn't even attack your knee. <laughs> and I was like – it was just like people were just very ignorant of that. So um, I was like, so I started my original social media posts were kind of differentiating what does a heel hook actually do? And that was kind of like what sparked everything. And then I started going crazy with it. Um, (laughs) But it kind of makes sense if like you, if most people train for IBGF and you can't heel hook in the IBGF, they don't train heel hooks. But that doesn't stop someone from, you know, putting a heel hook on you, even if it's, you're not supposed to do it in the gym, like people still do it. Like I've, I've mm-hmm. went to gyms and people, you know, it's like super taboo, like, but people are tapping heel hooks in the gi, which honestly, I don't think the gi, like heel hooks are more dangerous in the gi. The argument is like, there's more, there's more friction. So it's hard to escape your heel. That being said, if let's say like we're rolling, you attack a heel look, if I can grab your sleeve, you have no chance to finish the heel look. It's like literally mm-hmm. impossible. So I don't think it's more dangerous, um, but it's kind of like a gentleman's rule. Like just if you're going to attack uh, my foot or like a heel hook in the gi, like let me know. Because I, I rolled with a white belt. And he he heel hooked me solely because I'm like, well, he's not going to heel hook me. And then he heel hooked me. I'm like, <laughs> I was like, okay, we're playing for prison rules. It's cool. <laughs> so it's like rolling with me, mate. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds familiar, doesn't it? I don't yeah. heel hook. And, and I've yeah. worked with people. Like I worked with one guy that he, someone heel hooked him in the gi and they was like, oh, I didn't know I couldn't do that in the gi. And they're like, what are you talking about? So, uh, like I said, what's the most dangerous? Like I said, because of ignorance, ignorance, the uh, injury incidents, and then the, the the kind of like the the time off if you do have a tear, I'd probably go with the specifically an inside heel hook. If they, if they are that dangerous, why would they not just ban them right across the board and just get rid of them and save people's knees and careers. <laughs> you know, so I don't necessarily know if they're like, so it's interesting, right? Because I was a martial artist before I was a physical therapist. So you talk to most medical professionals, oh, I'll just get rid of it. But I mean, like, like I used to fight and, and I do think that like in martial arts, like it is good to keep effective techniques. Like I don't think a heel hook is a game breaker. Like, I think they're effective techniques and I think they can damage. I don't think everybody's going to blow their knee out with the addition of Helix. Like, I mean, we're seeing all these, you know, I think it was probably like uh, the EBI is where we start seeing a huge transition with the addition of heel hooks. Um, and the EBI has started like 2015, I think. So it's been eight years. So you've seen a lot of grapplers from there. And again, knee injuries do happen, but it's not like they're crippled and you don't even argue people like the meow brothers who are like notorious for like not tapping to things. Well, like if you look at like what the, probably the, the grossest injury we're seeing with the meows was when uh, I think it was Ty Riotolo are, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Meow. Meow and you see his like knee is bent like 30 degrees mm-hmm. in the wrong direction. So again, even though I think he looks probably are more dangerous 
the knee bar was the one that like did like that destroyed that guy's knee. Yeah. Mikey Musumenchi when uh, he had that oh. uh, one fight and he just compl- I don't even know what he done to that guy's leg in the end, but yeah, fuck you know you can't even dissect that, could you? <laughs> yeah. that, that guy broke everything. So that, yeah, everything, that Samo yeah. dude. That was so idiotic. Because here's the thing: like, I know people like want to be tough, and they say, "Hey, I'm not going to tap." But the problem is with this dude. Like, I don't. We're, you know, let's say his knees destroyed. Like, his career is over. Like, he, he literally might not have a career after that. His knees so so jacked up. It's mental, isn't it? Mm. You can't believe someone would do that just just yeah. to not tap. Because not only did he lose the match, he just yeah. to me just looks sound. He, he looks like an yeah. idiot. You know, just just tap. Yeah. So, swallow up your pride, man, and just tap, and then just try not to get put in that position, mm. you know, be better rather than yeah. just try and act hard. Yeah. I mean, like here, like I get it. Like as a competitor, like you want to win, like I've been in competitions and I've let my foot get stretched more than it probably should have because of like, again, like if I win, like what are the, re- you know, like what were the benefits? But if you have no chance of winning, like at that point, like his knee was completely destroyed. Like, so not only did he not win, but like once his knee like was destroyed, like did he, could he have won at that point? I don't think he could have. So it's like you're just taking unnecessary damage then. Yeah. And I think with the with the rotational like heel hooks, and we, we've talked about this a lot, but you know, you compare it to an arm bar where you you've got this you've got this warning, right? Where you go from here all the way to here yeah. to have a good think about whether you want to tap or not, typically. Yeah. I mean, often it's a lot quicker than that, we know, but you know, there, there's a there's there's a period of time in which you you know it's coming. You know it's coming. Clap. <laughs> yeah, and again, this is probably an ignorance thing, mate. Because I think once you've got your, your your sort of femur locked and someone's got their the crease of your your heel in their elbow, you know it's coming. But I think historically that seems to be where a lot of the injuries have occurred, where people don't have any pain prior to it just popping. But I also think like so they're waiting for pain. They're waiting for it to hurt. And I think because I because I'm a leg locker, I do heel looks. There is a point where like you feel like a stress. It's not pain. So I think this is that awareness, that education, that ignorance where it's like, you're like, oh, no, that's in, like something's going to happen. So like partly, even though it sounds counterintuitive, and again, I'm a physical therapist, like, but like, I don't think heel hooks should be, like, I'll I'll teach a white belt a heel hook because it's all about education. So if they understand the move, they understand how to apply it, they understand when they're going to hurt somebody. And like in training, like you just don't be a jackass, like don't try to pop people's foot, you're going to be fine. It's... You know, and I, I've even said this too, and I've told people like, look, I'm a black belt. I've tapped to people who are lower rank because if they have a heel hook, like they have it in, I got to tap. It's you know, but you have to have that humility, saying, "Hey, I'm going to tap to this guy," and not everybody does. All right, check your ego then. Yeah. Uh, my next question, which I think you kind of answered there a little bit and, and throughout, but I guess it was how how people best like, mitigate injuries, mm-hmm. um, you know, and it, it is that you know, I think we've already agreed that it's probably a bit of an attitude adjustment. Um, it's maybe a, a skill acquisition piece. And, you know, is it also a, you know, sort of, again, that, that sort of prehab or that strengthening, you know, is it all of those things or is there one that's that's more important than the other, would you say? No, I do all of them. So if you look at, so like I said, you know, humility, tap, you're going to avoid a lot of unnecessary injuries. Um, what can we do to strengthen our body outside of sport? Again, that's where strength and condition comes in. Um, like you look, there's a, there's a paper, it's not for jiu-jitsu, just overall – it compared stretching, balance, and strength. Strength training by far had the best effect for reducing overuse injuries. Now, we could it almost be like a, a whole different podcast about at how I would approach managing like strength, conditioning, and mobility for jujitsu. I mean, I, I think the key thing you you need to do though is you have to remember that strength training is range of motion specific. Meaning, if you don't change if you don't train a range of motion, you're not strength training it. So. A lot of times people say, oh, well, I want to injury, you know, do injury prevention for my body. And they start doing lifting and they take this arbitrary pattern. So most people take powerlifting, bench, deadlift, squat, et cetera, which again, I'm not, I'm not I do those. So it's, I'm not saying that they're bad exercises, but I don't necessarily know if they're the best way to prepare your body for jujitsu because how are these injuries happening? Well, it takes shoulder, like shoulders rotation. So if I'm not training shoulder rotation, I'm not actually preparing it for a Kimura, right? If I'm not training knee rotation, I'm not preparing it for a heel hook. So, and again, that's why I know this would probably be like an entirely different podcast, but these are things that I would consider. Now I'd say picking up a barbell and doing some strength training and it's still good. Like it's better than not doing it. But 
if I was going to design a, a program for an athlete, I would be a little bit more mindful on what's important. Again, like I, I discussed earlier, like people don't strengthen their neck. What's the number one thing that people are going to attack? It's going to be a choke. So damn right. I'm going to be strengthening the neck, you know? And it's always annoying when you look at a lot of like physios out there, it's like someone goes with a neck injury and it's essentially like scapular strengthening and neck stretching. I'm like, you realize that like we have to make the neck stronger to make it more resilient and they just don't do it. I mean, they just don't know how. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that was going to be my next question, which again, you've just touched on was, you know, we, we probably all know people that, you know, you get the guys who do strength work and you get the guys who do yoga yeah. Um, you know, you've talked a lot about strength and the importance of that. So I think it's very clear that that's, that's a necessity, mm -hmm. but stretching and, and sort of flexibility work, I mean, maybe from a application point of view is obviously very beneficial, but from an injury prevention point of view, does it, does it play a role? So I think if you look solely in the research, does stretching reduce injury? And I think the answer is no, but I think we can kind of like extrapolate what that means. And I think one, if you look at a lot of times people are just doing like an arbitrary stretching program. So like, let's say I'm working with you. I don't do an assessment. I have you stretch a whole bunch of crap. That doesn't mean that's what you need to stretch. Like you, like if we take both of us, if I have 10 minutes, we might all be doing different stretches based on whatever I find. So I think that, that makes one stretching harder. Two, if you take stretching, stretching is essentially focused on passive flexibility, which the more bendy somebody is, again, it gives us a little bit more buffer. And I'm going to do a post on this because I trained with this one guy. It's crazy. He's 57, easily the most flexible person in the gym. It's like you'd think he'd be the stiffest. He's he, he Pretty much his go-to submission is letting people get to side control and he triangles them from being bottom side control. It's, uh, it's wild. <laughs> But what? anyway, <laughs> isn't that a buggy choke? <laughs> he, he does try to buggy choke me. He does. It's different one though. Um, <laughs> the, but the problem with this guy is he's very bendy, but he's not strong. Like I said, strength training is range of motion specific. So just because you can be bent in a position doesn't mean that you're strong in that position. So what is the role of stretching? Well, if let's say like, you need to make sure that your body can do every movement you want it to be able to do. So for jujitsu, what are some of the key things? Well, you know, in jujitsu, you need a little bit more external rotation of your hips. You need a little bit more rotation of your shoulders because of Kimura's. You need a spine that can bend because so much of what we do, like inverting and, and stuff needs to be a rounded back. So if you don't have those joint prerequisites, then it makes a movement dangerous like you take inverting again inverting isn't inherently dangerous it's dangerous for people who don't have the joint prerequisites so if you don't have the the flexibility prerequisites that's where stretching comes in you can't develop strength if you can't move so again if you're stiff you might be strong in whatever range of motion you have but if it doesn't move that's good so stretching would improve your passive flexibility and then i would do various strength training to then strengthen whatever passive gains that you got. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's really good. Yeah, perfect. Um, and then I guess, again, for my own benefit, because I'm getting on a bit, yeah. um, and, I, and I imagine it's probably going to be the same sort of stuff, but, you know, for, for, for guys over sort of 40, sort of, you know, sort of pushing on towards sort of mid-40s, yeah. You know, is there anything in addition to what we've just talked about that they should be doing, whether to avoid injuries, would it be... Again, just sort of considerations to how they train, or is it just again about staying on top of the same stuff? I mean, I guess the, an important thing. So obviously, tap have some type of strength conditioning mobility program. But then the next is considered load management. So like, you know, you look at someone like let's say they they start jujitsu and they're like they, they look at Gordon Ryan. Oh, Gordon Ryan trains twice a day every day in strength training. So they're like, I'm trying to be Gordon Ryan. Which one? You know, he's pretty, pretty clear that he's on performance enhancers. They're not. It's a load management. So for you, like, you know, like I'm in my 30s too. I can't train the way that I did when I was in my 20s. Like now I realize it's very hard for me to do a double jujitsu session. It's just like I can do it, but there's going to be repercussions the day after. So is that worth it? So the key thing is you want to do a gradual progression of something. So if I'm getting ready for a competition, I'm slowly adding 
extra strength and conditioning. I can't just say, okay, well, right now I do jiu-jitsu four to five times a week. I want to add a strength program. Let's just add four days of strength training. So you just like double the amount of stress you did on your body. So what I would do, you know, again, slowly add, like let's say you're new to jiu-jitsu. You start with twice a, twice a week. You know, you do that for a few weeks. Then you add a third class. Do that. Now you add like a strength and conditioning session. So you kind of slowly add to make sure that your body is able to adapt. That's why these athletes can adapt because they've been doing this for years. So their bodies adapt to the amount of stress. And then again, as people age, you have to remember like you might not be as recovered. So you might almost unfortunately have to like subtract sessions. And then I guess consistency with training would be really key there for you. Yeah. So there's an interesting thing. Now, this was looking at sports in general, but it's a concept called acute and chronic workload. And um, I think, and again, this isn't necessarily in jiu-jitsu, but what I would extrapolate would be like live training, right? And in this one paper kind of like looked at like the, the kind of the injury prevention range would be anywhere from like 0. 0.7 to like 1.4 alteration in volume. So if you go from like training like five days a week to two days a week to five days a week, there's going to be a big jump in the amount of cute to chronic workload. So like I said, a gradual thing, if let's say you add a little bit of training each time, your body's adapting. But if you kind of like keep fluctuating, that's when people are at elevated risk for injury. Mm, yeah. Okay. I can probably, uh, <laughs> yeah. I can probably relate to that. Yeah. Um, and then if someone is consistent, so they, they've been training, I don't know, sort of twice a week for a year and they have a time to time out. They go on a holiday or, or whatever happens, something happens, not injury related. So they just have a break from training for, for whatever reason. But what's the period of time um, that you can kind of get away with without seeing some sort of conditioning regression um, where you then might need to restart that, that sort of incremental process of building back up the intensity? I don't know if there's a simple answer. Um, I do think one of the things that's interesting about strength training is strength, the the kind of like the the loss of strength over time is actually like it takes a long time. Like, you know, like I, I think I've read somewhere from anywhere from like 14 to 28 days is like a period. Like if I lift, I could go do that same lift and would have lost strength. So that's pretty promising from like a strength perspective. I think your conditioning will – you'll lose that a little bit quicker. Uh, maybe after like two weeks, you're going to start losing some conditioning. And the reason why I say that is because a lot of injuries happen when someone's fatigued. So I, I, I think the answer is is not super simple. But I would say like, you know, if you take two weeks off, I don't think it's going to make like a significant change. of If like you're pretty consistent, take two weeks off, I don't think you're like going to be like, man, I'm going to get hurt again. So um, mm. just kind of – Keep thing as as consistent as possible as much as you can. I think that would be the best way to go. Yeah. Okay. Good advice. Thank you. And a lot of people when they get older say, "Yeah, I can't. I can't heal like I used to. I can't recover like I used to." From a from a sort of tissue healing perspective, do you see a difference between someone who's twenty versus someone who's forty five? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's just biology, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know if this is at all your area of expertise, but I think you're a little bit more liberal about this in the States than maybe in the UK. But things like TRT mm -hmm. um, and a hormone sort of, um, yeah. sort of replacement therapy for, for guys in particular, do you find that tends to, to kind of rejuvenate that healing process for slightly older, older, older guys? Have you come across that much with any of your clients at all? I would say it does help. I mean, there's a reason people do it. Like it does something, right? Uh, you know. But it, again, it's hard to quantify that. Like, I, I think it does something. I think the key thing there would be like, is it appropriate? Because a lot of times people can kind of like, they take it whether they should or not. Um, I think if you're like actually at a, de a testosterone deficit and you take it, I think it could be ben like to, to kind of like get you back to your baseline. I think it's it's beneficial. Um, like most things in jujitsu, people kind of abuse that. And that's the, you know, I guess the trick there is like, is is it ultimately worth it, right? Because one of the things that's kind of scary about TRT, because I'm getting towards that TRT age. Uh, once you're on it, like you don't get off it, which is like mm -hmm. in my mind terrifying. Um, a lot of people, like you probably look at someone like Vitor Belfort, like he was clearly on steroids at the age of like 19, and then like he's like the perfect case where you can see how crazy his body fluctuates. Like he gets super jacked, he's in pride, then he goes to the UFC and he kind of deflates. And then there's TRT 
Vitor and he kind of boosts back up. And then they cut that and then he drops back off. And then he retires and now he's back up. Like it's like fascinating. You know, mm-hmm. like his endocrine system is is like probably so dysfunctional because he's on steroids for such a long time. But that specific isn't necessarily my scope of practice, but it just is interesting. Like that case study is just so fascinating to watch. Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm yeah. at that age, mate. So we'll see. Watch this space. <laughs> if you come back on the podcast in uh, in six yeah. months or so, and I'm I'm twice the size, you know something's going on. <laughs> um, and Mike, what uh, what services do you offer, mate? What, where can people find you if they want to get in touch and, and who you typically work with? Yeah. So uh, best way to uh, find me is on social media. It's the my handles doctor underscore kickass. So I work with people all over. So. I do uh, like I work with people locally for like actual injuries as like as a physio, but you know if you're working with you know um, I do strength training for jiu jitsu athletes. I do return to sport for jiu jitsu athletes. So like let's say they go to their their physio and they again they get better but they're not ready to go back to jiu jitsu. I can kind of fill that gap. So like I am like this is what we do to get you back to jiu jitsu. Um, so that's kind of like how I work with people now virtually. Um, and like I said, social media is the, the Instagram is probably the best way to reach out. Awesome. Nice. Thanks mate, very much, mate. Yeah, thanks for coming on, buddy. That's been awesome. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs>